welcome to the uh, second lecture of today. Uh, we will have a look, closer look to the uh, value of information analysis and decision analysis types. So uh, when we uh, think of, uh, of the scheme, we have uh, for this uh, training school, uh, now we are uh, taking the uh, complete part uh, where we have uh, models for and we are uh, aware of uh, our actual performance and uh, reality. <coughs> so what uh, I will talk about is uh, types of value of information um, which uh, have been uh, stated in the uh, early works about value of information going back to Ralf and Schleifer. I will talk of uh, uh, analysis types, so that uh, goes to the extensive and normal form analysis, so it's a form of uh, decision analysis, especially uh, pre-posterior uh, decision analysis. And then we uh, look to uh, decision rules and um, we are having a look to, to a few examples where uh, we yeah, think of the analysis types uh, and uh, we think about how to simplify uh, the calculations. And uh, this is done on an exemplary basis. You may have uh, already gone through the lecture slides. I uh, will probably uh, not be able to finish uh, on time at 12, but we, we are having the lecture at uh, 1 with uh, Karl Meilings and a uh, live connection then to Matteo Pozzi in US, in Pittsburgh. And uh, so uh, we are not going to postpone this, uh, this lecture. We will take it and we probably have to split up then uh, here uh, this lecture and take the rest in the, in the afternoon. Okay, so uh, when, we, uh, when we look in the uh, book of Reifer and Schleifer, the value of information analysis, uh, we can find there that uh, these four elements, and uh, we remember that uh, on the first day uh, we have been talking about the value of information analysis, and we identified uh, somewhere in these uh, sheets here, maybe, maybe it's even good. You can find it, but if you're on the first page. Yeah. 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 Here we developed it. This is what we talked uh, what we talked to. And uh, then I <coughs> introduce this sketch and this is basically uh, what we find here and how uh, the value of information analysis uh, is described in Reifer and Schleifer. And uh, I think this was a very important point uh, yesterday. The information that uh, we are dealing with, the SHM information is characterized by the type, Felder, right? It's the type. Uh, so that goes, uh, what does it mean for the structural systems per system performance? More specifically, uh, it's precision or accuracy or uncertainty and its costs. So, um, now uh, we have been adapting for the last uh, for the last years um, this approach uh, to the value of SHM information. And here, uh, here should, uh, here should be uh, SHM. So uh, we uh, may have the case where we have no uh, SHM information, and then uh, we have uh, the choice of our, our actions and chance of the uh, life cycle performance. Uh, with SHM, uh, we are uh, getting um, additional information. Uh, we uh, may be described with a strategy. Um, an information acquirement strategy or an SHM strategy 
and the chance of the outcomes. So this is the uh, adaptation of uh, this decision tree to the value of SHM information. And uh, what we have uh, basically introduced here is uh, the basic decision whether to perform SHM or not to perform SHM. So this is uh, very clearly um, added here, this choice. And uh, this decision tree uh, corresponds basically to, to this one. And then we have uh, also explicitly illustrated our prior uh, decision analysis, uh, which is here. So uh, this implies already, uh, we will see it a little later, uh, that uh, we are after the expected value of information. Because uh, this is a pre-posterior decision analysis and this is a prior decision analysis. And uh, if we subtract the expected uh, benefit uh, of uh, having SHM information uh, and having not SHM information, so B, uh, let's say the B1 here and the B0 here, uh, then uh, it's, uh, we are calculating the expected value of information. But uh, we will see that there are other uh, value of information types. So uh, this is what I just uh, introduced, uh, the value of information. Um, it's uh, B1 uh, minus B0, and uh, then B0 corresponds uh, to the optimal um, or to, ex to the expected uh, benefit uh, given the optimal action in, uh, the, uh, for the prior decision analysis. So uh, if I have this decision tree and I formulate this uh, mathematically uh, very close to what uh, Leif and Schleifer um, formulated, uh, then uh, it's the expectation operator uh, for the benefit uh, associated with the optimal action uh, uh, given the um, life cycle performance here, or in dependency of the life cycle performance. And this is uh, basically how, I, how this uh, optimal action uh, is uh, defined mathematically, so it's the A which maximizes um, this expression. I can also uh, write an equation for this part of the decision tree. Here I'm taking also the expectation uh, in regard to the uh, life cycle performance, but it's the posterior uh, expectation, so that means um, I'm using the uh, SHM information and, and the outcomes. And then it's an expectation uh, in regard to the outcomes of, the, uh, of our SHM. <coughs> and uh, again, it is with the optimal action. Uh, But also here now uh, it is the optimal SHM strategy, MGM. So that's that's my B1. So I may have uh, different SHM strategies, like uh, like it is shown here. And I would uh, identify the optimal uh, strategy. And that's my B1, uh, and that's the value of uh, of information. Okay, <clears throat> another uh, aspect, so um, I can calculate here the uh, a value of information gain. Uh, it is an absolute value, but I could also re relate this uh, to B0, uh, uh, then I 
have a relative value of information. So uh, this is basically our, uh, that's how we start out. And um, I will try to make this in the lecture. Uh, uh, I will, I would say, um, I will try to make it clear and uh, <laughs> we will try to uh, work through the meaning as, uh, step by step and try to uh, identify also some uh, some ways of easing uh, these uh, calculations uh, and we will rather not be able in this notation uh, to uh, to see uh, what this means and uh, how we can ease calculations. So um, let's introduce the uh, value of uh, information types. So uh, we are basically after an expected value uh, of information analysis. Um, so we have and an expected value of sample information analysis. So there is um, so this is um, abbreviated uh, EBSI. So uh, we have the difference, or we. Have uh, value of information analysis is the quantification of utility gain. So it's a utility gain in uh, pre, posterior, and prior decision analysis. Uh, we could also, uh, and this has been introduced uh, in Reifer and Schleifer, calculate the difference in the utilities or the utility gain uh, where we connect uh, posterior and the prior decision analysis. And uh, the sample information uh, refer to information with the finite precision, so we have uncertainties associated to this information. Taking these uh, concepts, uh, what situation, in what situation uh, would we uh, calculate a uh, conditional value of sample information? Anybody has an idea? Would you repeat? In what situation would we calculate a conditional value of information analysis? Yes, when we have the data, then we can do a conditional value of information analysis. But uh, then we uh, we see afterwards, after <coughs> posteriori. We see uh, whether the uh, whether it was worth or not to acquire the information, but we cannot influence the information acquirement at that stage and the strategy and how we should do it. So that's why uh, we are rather aiming at an uh, expected value of sample information analysis here. Another distinction, uh, which is in the in the textbook of Reifer and Schleifer, it's a distinction between sample and perfect information. And uh, perfect information uh, are uh, infinitely precise information, so we have no uncertainties associated with the information. Where could that be useful to calculate the or to calculate the perfect information? What do we get if we calculate with perfect information? Or what do we get if we... Pardon? Yeah, we are optimizing this, is right. Uh, we get boundaries. Yes, uh, and exactly what boundary? Yes, we get an upped upper boundary of uh, the, inf uh, the expected utility gain or the utility gain. Or expected benefit gain. Okay. So this is to illustrate uh, the two types. So for the value of the expected information, I'm asking uh, will the information requirement be cost efficient? It's a pre-posterior decision analysis. 
um, and here uh, for the value of conditional information, so that goes to the first two points here, uh, I'm asking has the spent money for acquiring the additional uh, information has just been uh, cost effective, so it's after the uh, information. Okay, let's uh, come to an uh, example, and we will uh, go through this example a few times. So uh, let's uh, think of a wind turbine, and um, uh, there's a lot of uh, control data uh, retrieved uh, in operation. Uh, so there's a, a machinery um, and um, the control data reveal that there is a problem um, with, uh, or there may be a problem with uh, resonance. And uh, it is estimated that uh, with a probability of 20%, there's a resonance uh, problem. So, what does that, does that mean for wind turbine? Um, uh, resonance. Any idea? So if a wind turbine is in resonance, what does that what does that mean? Where's the excitation? Pardon? It usually destroys. Yes, uh, it's a very uh, if there was no damping, uh, the amplitudes will be uh, infinite, so it's very dangerous. Uh, but uh, where's the excitation here? Yes, it's the uh, basically the rotor, and then it's the. Uh, Blade passing frequencies and the uh, multiples of the blade passing frequencies. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, where's the resonance? Or uh, where's uh, we have the excitation? And what is ex excited with this? The structure is excited. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So fine. Um, so when we normally design a structure, we just keep uh, apart the. Uh, Structural modes uh, from the excitation modes. Can we do it uh, in a wind turbine? Can, is it this simple in a wind turbine? Can we? Uh, yeah, because the excitation comes from the switch. Uh, yeah, right. But the, the uh, point here is the uh, rotor evolutions. So uh, the rotor speed is varying. So we have uh, varying excitations. And we cannot keep out the um, model, uh, uh, the natural frequencies uh, out of the excitation range. It's ne it needs to be passed. So, and uh, this is this uh, illustration uh, about, here we have the rotor evol evolutions. And then we have the rotor excitations uh, or 1p um, and uh, 3p and uh, 6p and uh, the excitations are varying. And then we have the first natural frequency here uh, of, uh, of our structure. And the uh, important thing is uh, in the operation range, uh, this is this range here, uh, rotor evolution. So there's a cut in uh, wind speed and a cut out uh, wind speed. And there uh, is the rotor associate, um, evolutions associated to. So uh, in this operation range, uh, we sh uh, the um, turbine should not be uh, in resonance. So that's the important thing. But it's, uh, if uh, when the uh, energy production starts, uh, the rotor needs to pass through the, um, the natural frequency, basically, the first natural frequency. OK, so uh, it is very important to, uh, to know the first natural uh, frequency. And uh, it's also true for the, for the higher. Uh, natural frequencies, uh, but they are not so critical. Uh, so it's very important to know exactly the uh, first uh, natural frequency. So uh, what happens if uh, if we are passing through here and we are operating uh, just after uh, 
yeah, uh, just a little higher. Uh, the excitation is a little higher than, uh, and the rotor evolutions are very near to uh, the starting point here, uh, where uh, this is cut. Uh, is the, will there be resonance or will there be no resonance? There will be resonance, but it will be uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it will be amplified. Yeah, it's uh, it's not so straightforward. Uh, if the frequencies are uh, just uh, the excitation and the natural frequencies are just a little, uh, or they have been in resonance, and then uh, the rotor speed uh, is in increasing, so uh, the frequencies are separated. But uh, the system may not be completely out of uh, resonance. And uh, this phenomenon is called uh, Sommerfield effect. And uh, actually there, there has been a, f a wind turbine where this was a problem, uh, but nobody knew. Unless uh, there was a very precise uh, analysis uh, and uh, also an SHM system uh, on it, so that we uh, could find out that uh, the turbine was uh, was already in production, uh, but there was still resonance. And even uh, there was a problem with uh, so the rotor evolutions, they correspond uh, to a wind speed. And uh, even here, uh, in this area, was the mean wind speed. So uh, very often this turbine was in uh, in a resonance state, not uh, not in a state uh, where the frequencies are just overlying, but uh, they were a little apart. But due to the Sommerfeld effect, uh, due to basically the uh, system needs energy input to get out of the resonance state, and if that did not happen, then uh, the turbine is uh, still in resonance. So. That's the background uh, for this task. Um, so uh, you have uh, basically two action options. Uh, one is to do uh, nothing, and the other one is to modify the operational range. Um, so then you basically uh, uh, shift uh, this line here uh, a little bit uh, to here, and you don't uh, start power production um, uh, you just wait that uh, or it, uh, the rotor is just released if there was enough uh, wind speed uh, so that uh, the rotor evolutions will be somewhere here. But then you lose uh, energy production. So, and uh, this is basically re reflected in the uh, system states we have here. So, uh, if there was no resonance, we have a benefit of 100. Um, and uh, if there was uh, if there was uh, resonance, uh, then uh, there would be a risk of uh, minus 200. And uh, if you modify the operational range, uh, it's uh, it's safe. Um, but here uh, we have a lower benefit, a lower energy production. And. Um, of course, uh, we can um, <coughs> we can do something about uh, knowing the uh, first natural frequency uh, very precisely. So you can calculate the first natural frequencies uh, with uh, with the model. So it's um, for this type of structure, uh, you will be able to do this with uh, for the first natural frequency with a uh, beam model. Uh, you just need to have the stiffnesses and the masses right. So the first natural frequency, you can take, uh, almost take any, uh, any finite element model. If you uh, want to have higher frequencies, uh, this is more complicated, uh, then you need basically sh uh, shell model. Uh, and yes, and then uh, the mass distribution, if the rotor is turning, and Nacelle is turning, the mass distribution will be different, and um, so this is then more complex. But the first natural frequency, uh, your uh, almost any uh, model where the 
masses uh, and the stiffnesses are probably represented, uh, will give you a relatively good estimation, but you have an uncertainty here for the first natural frequency. So you can, um, you can do SHM, uh, so meaning uh, you can do uh, experimental model analysis, and from experience, you know that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just go one back, I think, uh, for clarification that it's class clear for everybody. I think you should relate this uh, horizontal line, yeah. the natural piece frequency, and the associated uncertainty. This is directly related with the statement that you might have uh, frequency problems with 20%. So that's somehow yeah. the. You can imagine this horizontal line is somehow distributed vertically, the density function, and uh, uh, the exceedance probability that we are in the critical range is 20%. And that depends on the width of this <laughs> density function. No? And now with the updating, we want to uh, yeah, make yeah. this uh, uh, more precise. I think that's important, because that's the a priori uncertainty we have about whether we have a problem or not. And I think in practical situations, this is very critical to uh, quantify. Yeah, we can <coughs> uh, we don't think of it like this. Yeah. Yeah. At least, uh, as, as I understand, it's a very nice example. Yeah, yeah, well, we can think of uh, it like this. Um, but we, yeah, okay, that's, thank you. Um, okay, so we can do uh, model analysis, and uh, the model analysis indicates the uh, proper system states with uh, high probabilities, but there's also a probability of false indication here. And uh, we have a cost uh, of, of 10. So we can uh, readily do a uh, prior decision analysis. So uh, we have the probabilities of our system states, and we have the consequences. They, they would be here, uh, and uh, by the calculus we have just seen, we can calculate the expected uh, benefits here uh, and here, and we take the maximum uh, here because we, have, we are maximizing the benefit. So uh, we just take the 50 here, this is our B0. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this was uh, this part here. Uh, now we uh, can do the same <laughs> try analysis, but we say uh, we have additional information uh, Z1. So we have, uh, we have an indication uh, of uh, Z1, so that the system is in state X1. And uh, this is the posterior decision analysis, and here it's the same decision tree, uh, but uh, now we have uh, Z1, and we would calculate here an um, updated probability of the system states. This is the same we can do with uh, Z2. And that together would be uh, the uh, pre-posterior, or th that would be even the, um, the value of information analysis. We have the pre-posterior part here, prior here. So uh, if you do this uh, decision analysis, um, we can uh, put the uh, benefits as uh, as we had it on the slide uh, here, the costs uh, here, so we have uh, here the cost of the action A1, that, that was 20, uh, and here we have uh, obtained the, or oh, we are doing an experiment, we are doing the model analysis, uh, and then we have costs of 10 here, uh, throughout uh, here, and uh, when we do the action A1, we add 20 here. That's accumulated, we have the total um, consequences, benefits and consequences here. And uh, we just worked through our uh, decision tree. Uh, the updating uh, here uh, with uh, Z1. Uh, gives the posterior probability of the system state x1, so it's x1 uh, given the information z1, 
and that has been calculated to 0.96 and then we have the complementary event, it's 0.04 um, so this uh, is also if we have the action A1 uh, it's the same probabilities, if we have the indication uh, Z2 then we have uh, different posterior probabilities here and um, we then need uh, here the uh, probabilities uh, of, uh, of indication, of indication Z1. And that is, uh, that is the point from yesterday. Uh, the probability of the indication uh, Z1 uh, needs uh, or depends on our prior probabilities of the system states. <coughs> and, uh, here we do it uh, simply with, um, with discrete probabilities. Uh, in uh, yesterday we did it uh, with continuous uh, uh, probability functions. So and then, uh, so here again we have the decision nodes. So we take uh, the maximum from these two. So that's forty. We take the maximum from these two, that's uh, 78. And then it's uh, 0 0.25 times 40 plus 0 0.75 time, uh, times 78. And this will give us uh, the B1, and this is uh, 68.5. So this is uh, basically to establish the uh, decision tree. It's an example for, for the decision analysis, uh, which we will use to um, okay, yeah, which we will use uh, to see uh, something of the introduced uh, concepts at the beginning. So uh, this was the decision tree for the pre-posterior decision analysis. Here we have the uh, uh, it's basically this tree. Here, this is the pre-posterior part. We have also added here the prior part. And we see that the expected benefits here are higher than here. So this is the decision node. So the uh, decision is uh, that the experimental model analysis should be performed as uh, we have uh, higher expected benefits. So that's the, uh, that's the decision node. And we take the maximum of this and of this. So, um, we sh also should recognize uh, here the branches which are uh, leading <coughs> to the uh, optimal utilities or optimal expected benefits. And uh, here for the prior decision analysis, uh, it is uh, we need to modify the operational range. <coughs> that means we um, we are producing less energy, um, uh, but that's that's optimal uh, given that uh, there is a 20% chance of uh, of a system state we we don't want to have. So. This is basically uh, the branch where we calculate uh, where this uh, 50 comes from. That's very obvious. Uh, here uh, we also have uh, a decision node, and it's then uh, if we have a decision node, it's either this branch or this branch, or this branch or this branch. So uh, what? Uh, and we can read here the optimal actions form. So it's, uh, if you get the indication Z1, uh, the optimal action is A1. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the branch uh, which provides us this uh, result. And here, uh, if you get the indication uh, Z2, then uh, the optimal branch is to, uh, Again, to modify the uh, operational range, here we don't need to modify the operational range because the indication is that uh, the stru structure is okay. And uh, here the indication is uh, that the structure is uh, not okay, so uh, we need to modify the operational range. So, uh, 
So, uh, one could say, uh, may not, or we should not calculate the complete decision tree, but we could somehow um, make it a little easier. But uh, before we come to that, um, let's have a look to our um, types of value of information analytes. So if we have this uh, decision tree uh, for this example, we find the uh, expected value of information. We uh, find it uh, as the difference between uh, the B0 star and the B1 star. So this is where we find the expected of value of information, uh, where we are primarily after. Uh, the uh, conditional value of information, uh, we, we always uh, use here uh, uh, our uh, maximum expected uh, benefit uh, for the prior decision analysis. So we always use the B0 star here. Um, and then uh, we can calculate the conditional value of uh, the information Z1. So given the ind indication Z1, uh, we can calculate the uh, conditional value of information. Or we could calculate the conditional value of information uh, given Z2. So that's the illustration uh, of the uh, different types of uh, value of information uh, with this decision tree. And we can uh, really calculate it. So that means uh, the uh, value of information, uh, given that we have an indication that 1 is 28, uh, that means uh, here the indication uh, is that the structure is okay. So this has, has a value because we don't have to do anything. That's the mechanism here. Uh, but if we get the, uh, value, uh, the indication Z2, then uh, this uh, has a negative value uh, because we have to uh, modify the operational range. Uh, when we calculate the expected value of some information, then uh, still, uh, or it is positive, it's 18.5. Uh, um, and that <coughs> uh, comes, uh, yeah, that has to do also that, uh, with the fact uh, that uh, the uh, probability of, uh, of the indication that the structure is intact uh, is uh, relatively high. And uh, we should be uh, aware of uh, here, we just have one uh, SHM strategy. We just have this model analysis. Uh, we did not vary any factor in the model analysis, or we did not have any uh, other approach. Um, so our B1 uh, is um, basically associated to just one experiment, E1. But there could be another experiment, E2. And uh, we could have uh, then another branch, E2, here uh, with also expected benefits. And of course, uh, the conditional value of sample information here is also conditional on the experiment uh, E1. We could have another experiment, uh, E2, and also uh, outcomes, maybe even more, uh, like we have seen in the previous uh, examples. Okay, um, so this was the types of uh, value of information analysis. Uh, what am I after here? Okay, we uh, are now uh, would, or I would like to introduce now uh, decision analysis types. So um, that goes now uh, to the way of uh, how we are working through the decision tree. So you may have noticed uh, that we have gone through uh, this decision tree here from, from this side. We're calculating from this side to here. This was the last result. Uh, how is it done in practice? So uh, when we think of a practical situation, uh,
So we, uh, we have instruction and we have our measurement equipment. Then we go there. What happens? We go there, we measure, we get what? You, we get an indication. So, um, we are coming from this side. So that's the practical way, and we would need to know uh, what? If we have the indication, we sh need to know what we should do. Yeah, we need to have decision rules. Okay. So, um, and the decision analysis also uh, knows about this. Um, so we've been working through the extensive form because, uh, yeah, here you need uh, <coughs> you need to work through all the branches, and you cannot miss a branch basically. Uh, and we have been uh, writing it like this, but we could also write it in a normal form. Uh, and here uh, we see that the uh, expectation uh, operators are uh, exchanged, uh, and here we have a conditional expectation. But uh, we are Again, after the uh, optimal SHM strategy, and uh, now here uh, there's also a difference. Here we have the optimal action, uh, but here we are looking for the uh, optimal uh, decision rule. And this is basically uh, what I what we just found out. Um, I need to know with what indication uh, I, I should do, and then uh, there's a decision rule independency of the. Uh, indication uh, leading basically uh, to the action. This is the uh, decision rule. So, uh, okay, so this is uh, very close to what we find in uh, Reifer and Schleifer. Uh, and it's uh, very uh, hard, to, at least it was for me, uh, to imagine what this really means. So, probably it's also hard for you. <laughs> More than. <laughs> So um, let's uh, go through this. So we have the uh, extensive form where we are working through the decision tree in this uh, direction. And we could uh, now um, write uh, the extensive form uh, analysis uh, by applying the uh, introduced uh, formulas uh, to the example. Uh, so it looks a little better. Um, and uh, basically we are describing here uh, the probability, we have uh, the Z1 branch here, that's the probability of uh, Z1. And then uh, we uh, have a maximization operation uh, for this expression, <coughs> referring to um, the A0 branch here for this branch, and uh, the other <coughs> part uh, will be here, that's the A1 branch. Plus the probability uh, of Z2 times the maxim maximization of uh, this branch and or, or this branch. So this is the extensive form. Um, and we, uh, we now uh, just need to replace uh, the, uh, or we just need to rewrite uh, this expression here. So that's the uh, patient updating. So it's posterior in, uh, that's the posterior probability in relation to uh, Z1, because we are in this branch here. So it's uh, the probability of x1 given z1, uh, and this is the Bayesian update. And we uh, we now replace all the uh, posterior probabilities with this expression, 
meaning, uh, of course, uh, here uh, it's the probability mm -hmm. of uh, x2 given z, z1. Uh, and here it's the probability of x2 given z2. And uh, when we do this, we uh, note that uh, the uh, denominator here is uh, p, uh, the probability of the indication z1, but we uh, multiply it here. So we multiply this in, and then we uh, come to this expression. And that's, that's the normal form. Very simple. <laughs> And now we uh, also this uh, this arrow has changed. That's normal form analysis. Very very simple. I noticed that I'm uh, much better than yesterday with the number of slides. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday it was ten after one hour. <laughs> Okay, um, and uh, now um, let's say uh, we, we have done this decision analysis in an extensive form, and we know the, the optimal branches or the uh, branches we need to calculate to come to our result. And then uh, we uh, need uh, here to define, uh, so, but that comes uh, because we are working through the uh, decision tree in, in this direction. So we need to uh, define here a decision rule so that we can connect the outcome to the action. And now, uh, because we have done the the form analysis, we uh, now the decision rule or the optimal decision rule or the decision rule which leads to optimality. So that's uh, highlighted here. Um, let's say this is our decision rule D. Uh, we should also be, uh, if we do the normal form analysis, um, we are not consistently uh, or the other way around. Um, if we do the normal form analysis and we have not done the extensive form analysis, we need to uh, define the decision rules so that all branches of the decision tree are covered. Yeah, this is uh, the comment here. Okay, so we work with this uh, decision rule we, because we already identified it. And then we see uh, we can cross out uh, the branch here uh, and this branch here. So this corresponds to the uh, branches we do not need. And then we can also cross out the maximization and it becomes much easier. So it is, uh, this expression in normal form analysis and uh, this was the uh, expression in the extensive form analysis, and that's what we already uh, did. But we could do it, uh, we could have it simpler, like this. But we would need, uh, of course, we would need to know the decision rules which are leading to optimality. And uh, if we do not know the uh, decision rules leading to optimality, uh, we would have this expression, but uh, but we see that uh, that we do not do uh, do not have Bayesian updating in here, so we don't have to update uh, in the normal form analysis. Uh, actually, in the extensive form analysis, uh, we are first dividing by the probability of uh, Z1, and afterwards we are multiplying with the probability of Z1. So that's uh, maybe one operation to much. Okay. 
So uh, if we uh, if we really do this, uh, and we uh, we do this for our example now, uh, we uh, get the same result. So the B zero uh, is fifty, and the B one. Uh, so we just input the expressions here. Like you, yeah, like we have done before, and it's uh, the same value of uh, the same expected value of information. So they are uh, the analysis forms are equivalent. First thing, uh, it is about uh, Bayesian updating conditional probabilities, total prob probability theory. That's basically all all we need. Okay. Um, okay, this is just for summary. Uh, extensive form, uh, right hand side to the left hand side, uh, Bayesian updating is required, and in the normal form, it's the other way around. It can be uh, computationally more efficient because there's no unnecessary operations. And uh, if the optimal branches were, uh, were known before, then uh, this can be uh, very powerful. Uh, but here, for the normal form, um, ah, okay, yeah. So this is normal form, extensive form, and this comment uh, goes uh, to uh, what you also found out in a practical situation. When we go there, we will get an indication, and we would need to know uh, what this means uh, or what we should do, <coughs> and. Uh, that's why for the practical implementation, we uh, also need the decision rules. So uh, what have we just done? Branch eliminating? Can we, this, uh, should we do, uh, should we try uh, one more idea on branch eliminating? Because it can ease our calculation, we have found out. So now we do, um, we separate the decision analysis in two decision trees. Decision tree one is only associated with benefits and costs associated to the system states and uh, an SHM. So, uh, We do an experiment and we have a cost. So we have 10 uh, throughout this decision tree. And then uh, it's also the uh, system state. The costs for the system states, they are uh, yeah, associated to the system states. And it's the same. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's important. It's the same uh, for the complete decision tree. And here we have a decision tree too. And uh, here we have only the action dependent costs. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have the uh, action here and, and these actions uh, in here. It's, uh, and then uh, there's also uh, costs uh, which are, or the summation of these two uh, must, uh, must give the uh, decision tree we had uh, previously, and also the, the consequences uh, here on the, uh, on the right side of the decision tree. So that's why there is uh, here some numbers. So then we take the uh, decision tree one, uh, so this one, uh, where we have only the benefits and costs associated to the system states and SHL. And we uh, can write this expression, so here uh, the 10, uh, that's the inspection or the uh, cost associated to experiment 1. We have the 10s here, uh, so we just can take it out. And then uh, it's still the maximization operation, and so we write this in normal form analysis. 
But here, uh, now, uh, the B is only dependent on the system state. And there's no dependency on the outcome or, or on the action. Uh, okay, and then, they, then there must already be something visible. Um, what's that? Okay, we can, uh, we can uh, reformulate uh, this equation to, uh, to this one. And uh, now we, uh, we work with the uh, conditional probability and uh, the commutative uh, law of the uh, intersection operator. So that's basically uh, the set of laws uh, which are responsible for the Bayesian updating. So uh, this is set operation, and this is the definition of the conditional probability. And uh, due to the uh, Commutative law, uh, we can write it the other way around, and uh, it's uh, basically the Bayesian updating. If you put this uh, into uh, this uh, expression here, uh, then uh, <coughs> we, uh, we have a very, uh, we can reach a very, very simple uh, expression for uh, calculating the uh, expected benefit here. Um, for our decision tree one. Uh, so that only depends on the prior probabilities. And then we uh, come up with, uh, with 30 here. Now we need to take the uh, second decision tree and uh, we also define a decision rule here um, because we uh, we already know the, uh, the uh, it's again the optima uh, optimality decision rule uh, we have identified with the ex extensive form. So uh, it's basically if we have the indications at one, uh, we will uh, do uh, a zero, but there, there are zeros here. So this branch uh, is, has vanished. So we just have to calculate one branch here. And if you do this uh, in normal form, then it's 38.5. Uh, uh, and 30 plus 38.5 is the result of the original uh, decision tree. And in between, we had uh, okay. We had two uh, two uh, decision trees, uh, but we could solve it extremely easy. And it's also interesting to note uh, that uh, that in the decision analysis. Basically, uh, what we're doing here, uh, it's about the actions uh, and uh, some costs may be completely independent uh, of, um, of the actions and this can also be uh, extended to the system states, basically, so that the system states are, uh, so that goes to the first uh, decision tree here, that uh, the uh, benefits and costs associated to the system states are only dependent on the prior probabilities. Okay. Uh, this looks like uh, that I can uh, finish uh, shortly after 12 uh, this lecture with 53 slides. Yesterday it was 40 slides. Uh, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> are, there, uh, are there any questions at this point? <coughs> yes.
It's one thirty and twenty and then fifteen. Can you repeat the question if you can Could you speak up? Here, to the, yeah. this one? Yeah, Wait, this is the action here, and uh, when there's one, uh, uh, this yeah. decision tree plus or this uh, table plus this table uh, must give uh, something which we have had some time before. Yeah, here, this one. It must give uh, this one, the original decision, or the original consequence uh, set. That's, that's the trick. Okay, but the, the decision tree to how it works. The summation is going to be Yeah, yeah, but, but uh, it's, you, you define the, um, so you go with the definitions. Here, uh, you, you put in here the benefits and costs associated to the system states and SHM. Okay. And here, you only put in the action dependent costs, so this is 20, and uh, something which uh, needs to be done so that uh, this decision tree uh, or the uh, consequences here plus these consequences here uh, give the original problem. So it's, it's defined. Okay, um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about reliability and uh, risk-based inspection planning from a, a decision analysis perspective. So uh, we have been seeing these pictures uh, yesterday, uh, and the. Uh, Inspection planning uh, is about uh, that we do an inspection plan for a few decades, um, normally, uh, and uh, it is a pre posterior decision analysis problem, and it uh, can also be formulated as a value of information analysis, but <coughs> here we look at it uh, from the perspective of a pre posterior decision analysis. And we uh, let's work through uh, a decision tree uh, for uh, a component with eight years of service life uh, with two inspections. Uh, and um, wait, uh, for the inspection planning, the probabilities of safe and failure states are usually described with a fracture mechanics model. That's where we, that's uh, the underlying um, modeling for our events, and the uh, inspection provides uh, in the, uh, information about the presence of, of, of a crack, uh, so indication or no indication. So we, uh, we, we have heard yesterday how this can be uh, can modeled, that's the NDT and the uh, performance modeling. And uh, here, uh, this is the very important uh, thing you have here in the decision analysis. And we have it uh, have had it yesterday for uh, continuous uh, damages. So um, <coughs> the indication and uh, or no indication is dependent on the prediction of uh, uh, of our damages. So uh, the decision tree uh, looks like this. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It, it is exponential with the number of inspection times, so it's uh, to the power of two. Uh, the, uh, the branches are increasing uh, to uh, exponentially with the number of inspections, and it's, uh, it's uh, proportional to the number of uh, indications <coughs> and the number of actions. So uh, it's uh, two times two, to the power of two, that's uh, four to the power of two with 16 branches, uh, this is what we end up here. So uh, what we have here is in year zero, uh, it's safe and then it's always uh, fail and safe, uh, fail and safe, or safe and fail. Uh, and then we can do an inspection and we may have 
uh, here uh, no indication, we can do nothing or we can do repair. If we have, uh, in, uh, is it, uh, if you have an indication, uh, then we can do also do nothing or uh, do repair. So even for eight years, just two inspection times, uh, just two outcomes, just two actions. Uh, we have already a decision tree which uh, we cannot work through like, like I've done just now. Okay, uh, this is what I just told. Um, so what can we do? Any ideas? What can we do? Yes? Can you reduce the number of branches fail or safe? you have one each year at the moment, could you get a competency for the whole period for the next inspection? Yes, okay, you could, uh, you could calculate uh, from here directly uh, from here directly to here, right? Every time, yeah. Yes, 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 but still you would need to have here uh, in, in, this, in this branch you would need to account for the uh, no indication information and here for the no indication information and what they repaired it. Well, what can we do? So suppose uh, you're going uh, you're going out with your inspection equipment and you get an indication. So what will you do? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically, if you get an indication, uh, you should repair. That's the best information you have. And uh, because as the uh, inspection operator, you do not know really how critical this is. Uh, so it's also a reason for just doing the repair and then there's another reason uh, you may have uh, so if you think of offshore structures uh, you're going uh, anyway to the structure you have a vessel uh, and uh, you don't go there again with some slightly different equipment so you repair and uh, Yeah, this is one, uh, this is a decision rule, basically. And the, uh, what we just uh, talked about, uh, the decision rule is somehow already there, it's, uh, it's implemented. It's how uh, in the offshore oil and gas industry uh, uh, inspections and repair actions are performed first. Uh, and uh, this is what we have shown uh, this year. Uh, it's also the optimal action. It's, uh, it's uh, optimal in the value of information and To do uh, the repair just after the uh, inspection if you get uh, an indication. So that's the uh, red dots here. If you, if you detect the damage, then uh, from year uh, four in, in the service life of 30 years, uh, it's uh, optimal just to do uh, after the indication. Uh, in the very beginning, it's optimal to uh, repair later. But uh, op the optimality for most of the times uh, during the service life is just to do the repair after inspection. So this is, uh, yeah, th this is super. And now we have this decision tree, uh, so we can shift around the time axis uh, here from uh, here we have the time axis here from uh, year zero to year eight, and then um, we have a decision rule in our decision tree. So if we have no indication, we don't do anything. If we have an indication, uh, we do repair. And now we have uh, four branches left. So that's super. Uh, what else can we do? 
still four branches. or no indication and then if you have indication yeah exactly then if you have indication and repair okay exactly you have only the survival option okay oh. instead yeah. of between year two and three I see that uh, after repair you can have uh, survival yeah, yeah. and failure <laughs> it was just beginning it's just Okay, yeah. probably this has been forgotten here. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So uh, let's think about uh, what uh, repair means. So how does a component behave after the repair? So it's fatigue cracks, um, and if you know that there is one, it will be grinded, and then it will be welded. That's the procedure. It can be done underwater also. Ideally, it would go back to new. <coughs> Ideally, it would be a new component. Yeah. <coughs> it would behave uh, like a new component, so we would go here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the other idea is, uh, you probably already know, uh, these uh, simplification rules. Uh, the other idea could be that uh, uh, that component uh, behaves uh, like one component which had no indication. Mm -hmm. So and if you do this, Uh, yeah, okay. Then we have just one branch left. And uh, if you do the other uh, simplification rule, um, we have also only one branch, uh, but now it's a little more complicated because you need to go back to the uh, decision uh, trees here with different uh, service lines. And this has been uh, basically done in 2000 by, uh, by Michael Faber. Uh, the simplification rule one, and here I think uh, the simplification rule two. Uh, this goes to uh, what, what you have uh, said. This has been implemented, uh, has been found out uh, here in the PhD thesis of Daniel Schwab. So, uh, to conclude, was there anything else? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, we will go through the rest of the slides in the afternoon, um, but uh, this is rather the task uh, task we are doing. But to conclude, uh, for a value of information analysis, for decision analysis, we need a uh, decision tree, uh, a clear definition of the uh, events, uh, and the events are defined with our limit state functions. Yeah. And if we have that, we need to work through the uh, decision tree uh, and we need to find a way of, uh, of solving it efficiently because it can uh, easily explode. And we can work through it efficiently by uh, being aware of the extensive and normal form analysis, by being aware of decision rules, by being aware of identifying uh, decision rules, uh, optimal decision rules uh, with the extensive form and then utilizing it in the normal form. That's one procedure. <coughs> uh, we can, uh, th there was another approach uh, where we just after branch eliminating, so we could uh, create zeros and, uh, and have two different decision trees. Uh, and then uh, we uh, need to associate uh, our, um, yeah, our decision tree, uh, how can we uh, 
how can we simplify it and we need to associate it to the real world? Uh, are the decision rules are already there? Uh, is the decision scenario, uh, the integrity management, uh, and they go there anyway with the inspection and repair equipment, then the decision rules are already there. Uh, so we can uh, just employ it, and then we can uh, think of finding physical relations uh, and to avoid some branches. So this was the last part of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your uh, attention.